and welcome to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm Marco Leona, the head of the Scientific Research Department here at the Metropolitan Museum. It is my pleasure to join you for today's program, Art and Science, a Shared Enlightenment. I came to the Met 20 years ago to fund the department of the museum charged with studying the work of artists of all periods and of all places in the world to, start to learn by looking at them with scientific means something about the lives, the times, the world, and the minds of the artists who created our collection. Our work is in the laboratory and it would be really interesting today to see a scientist, uh, one of the most eminent American chemists of all time, and a phenomenal artist, discuss art and science on entirely different levels. Um, the theoretical level of quantum physics that road brought to chemistry, and the work of the artist. Inspiration, passion, intelligence, genius, experimentation, creativity, those are not words exclusive of science or art, they're shared by those two. And I think that we will see that in today's talk. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to thank the people who made this program possible. Um, Heidi Holder, my colleague, the head of education, who embraced this initiative from the very beginning. Mariana Siciliano and Camille Sides in public program programs. The front of the house team who welcomed you today and the production team who is assisting us in making this program possible in their beautiful house. Roald Hoffman, I met him when I came to the Met 20 years ago. And we started talking about his interest in art, my interest in art and science. But of course, I had heard his name. I've known of him since my college days. As one of my professors said, he told us why things happen the way they did. His contribution to the way chemistry is today is fundamental, extraordinary. Enrique Martinez Celaya is an artist, author, and former physicist. You can see his work at the Hispanic Society of America up on 155th Street and Broadway, and I encourage you to do so. You will see, first of all, a beautiful museum, an extraordinary collection, and an artist who must have realized this dream of bringing in his inner child, his 10-year-old self, in dialogue with Velazquez. His works are extraordinary. The exhibition is a dream. Enrique is a professor of humanities and arts at the University of Southern California and a Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth College. Besides being the author of nine books, his work is here at the Met, but again, go and see it at the Hispanic Society of America. Krista Tippett, today's moderator, the the trade union of this dialogue is a Peabody Award-winning broadcaster, National Humanities Medalist, and New York, New York Times best-selling author. She created and hosts On Being, which has won the highest honor in broadcast, internet, and podcasting. She leads the On Being Project, which produces a second successful podcast, Poetry Unbound, and is evolving to meet the calling of the post-2020 world. Emergent in 2024 is the Lab for the Art of Living, alongside gatherings and quiet conversation to accompany the generative people and possibilities within this tender, tumultuous time to be alive. Her books are Speaking of Faith, Einstein's God, and most recently, Becoming Wise, an inquiry into the mystery of, and art of living. It is my great honor and greatest pleasure to welcome to the stage Roald, Enrique, and Krista. idea that there is an inherent dissonance 
or enmity, uh, or even a distance between art, the arts and science is not true either to the history of art or the history of science. Um, Raoul, you have bemoaned the language of C.P. Snow, of the two cultures, which imprinted the 20th century cultural imagination with this idea that there is a divide so stark that the two sides can no longer communicate or comprehend each other. But the natural philosophy from, from which Western science emerged um, did not recognize any separation in this part of the human, and in these two, in these aspects of the human enterprise. I think, Enrique, when we spoke in 2017 and had a wonderful interview, we talked about Goethe, how he believed he would, he believed he would, might be remembered for his scientific experiments of, on, around light and color rather than as a poet and a, and a writer. Um, and actually, it's always fascinated me that the word scientist was coined as, and it was modeled after the word artist, as a corollary to the word artist. These two aspects, again, of the human enterprise um, have always been in conversation, if not in outright symbiosis. And they are, in fact, in symbiosis in these two lives. And so what we're going to do for the next hour is explore this as it is embodied in the two of you and also in your friendship. Um, I did learn backstage that they, you came to know each other quite a long time ago when Enrique was uh, a sci uh, an undergraduate studying science and, and met this gentleman who took an interest in, in, in your science and you were very proud of everything you knew <laughs> and had no idea who he was. Um, but there are also really intriguing synchronicities um, in your human stories and also how your paths with and through the two cultures, um, how that comes together in you. So Enrique, you were always making art, uh, but you've said that at first physics and mathematics were more exciting to you. And you built a laser and you worked on a nuclear accelerator, but then at some point you left physics to become a painter. Um, and Raoul, you were always a writer, I believe, of poetry, and you've also written essays and plays, um, but something you wrote is, uh, not having enough courage to pursue the world of humanities opening up around me, I learned to love chemistry. <laughs> and I think chemistry is the better for it, too. <laughs> um, so, and another thing that is very stunning is that both of you were formed, your families and your childhoods were formed in a crucible of violence and catharsis and exile. Um, your family fled the Cuban Revolution, um, your family fled the Holocaust, and you, so you both came of age in a world that had utterly stopped making sense. And it, it, I, I became curious as I was pondering this, if you think that that it was part of staying fully alive and navigating a world that had stopped making sense that contributed to you very actively keeping these capacities um, alive inside you? Well, uh, I think that was part of it, and I, I've written in one poem about that, that I wanted watching through a window and hiding in a Ukrainian attic room that that I wanted the world to come out right. Um, and I was, in some ways, it gave me hope, but I was also a little bit naive in the sense that I was attracted to mathematics and to physics and to places where there were theorems to be proven. Uh, but in the end, I wound up in the right place, which is chemistry, which has some sense to it, and I try to make more, but a lot of it is, is somewhere else. There are intuitions, there are feelings, there is even having to memorize something, and, and it's the combination of making sense of the world and coming to peace with with the complexity of real life. Uh, that meant something to me. I don't know if this makes sense to Enrique. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's similar to me. The dislocation of a life of departure and immig immigration, 
the revolution, trying to make sense of what had happened to my family. <coughs> Nothing makes sense, so I needed to order that chaos in some manner. And science, mathematics, philosophy seemed like a way to attempt to order that. Um, and it was helpful. Um, also, science made me feel very clean mm -hmm. when I didn't feel very clean. Uh, but, and that was a, a great service it provided to me in my teenage years. Can you say some more? What do you mean clean? What, what, are, what, are, you, what are you saying when you say that word? You know, you, when you grow up in a situation, you live, I left Cuba when I was seven, moved to Spain during Franco in a very challenging situation. Um, I didn't know what anything around me was. I felt that everything was messy, and I was messy. Mm -hmm. I had so many disquiets inside myself. And then when I took mathematics and physics and built my laser, it felt very calm mm -hmm. and very clean because there's no room in physics for personal mess. Mm. Actually, there is something interesting about being an immigrant, uh, which both of us were. Uh, when you come to us, to another country, and in my case, I didn't know the language. English was my sixth language, not because we're so smart with languages, but because we were refugees after a war that we had to learn. No one asked us what school to go to. Uh, we went to whatever school was there. But being an immigrant, Coming to the United States, it was sixth grade, it was PS 93 Queens, and I was an outsider. I didn't know English yet. So you stand and watch, and there is something about the immigrant experience that may lead you towards science. Usually also European trained kids are ahead of Americans on the mathematics side. That was probably true for you coming from Spain. So uh, I think the immigrant experience helped us and in some way pushed us towards it's science. It's really, it's really, it's really fascinating. <coughs> um, so you, you, ha you sent me an essay, or it's a long essay, which might be a book in Becoming, I think, called Pebbles. Um, and you are actually trying to um, propose a... Uh, a, a nuanced um, other way of in from the two cultures. And so you, um, yeah, on the, you know, what is that, this meeting ground between art and science? And you do also lay out differences. And of course, we could start with the differences, which is what we do in most places in this culture, but that's, we're not going to do the expected thing. And it's things like, you know, you're looking for solutions versus resolutions, that myth is avoided by science and embraced by art. Um, so, but what I want to do for, the, for this conversation is dwell with the long list of commonalities that you, that you lay out and, and just, just go deep on a few of them, but not in a simplistic way. Um, uh, ho while we also hold the notion of deep truth from physics, I think you quote Niels Bohr in that essay, um, the definition of a deep truth or a profound truth is that its opposite is also true as he said, in contrast to trivialities where opposites are obviously absurd. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first commonality um, between art and science that you name is that they are both joined in creation, that art and science are acts of human creation, both. So, so let's explore that as a deep truth. Well. The graphic that's before you is doesn't need a story of telling of Mendeleev's first draft of the periodic table of the elements, a masterpiece of science, and at right, William Blake's poem, The Tiger, separated, but the, the last draft of that before it was printed. You know, I think it's up there. Oh, I see it okay. back here, but it's not behind. Uh, it's us. not behind. It was, it was for a while. Okay. Some of you saw it. Okay. Um, both are objects of human creation. Neither Mendeleev's table nor the Blake poem grow on trees. I have nothing against what grows on trees, but but these are objects that human being beings have created, and 
they're worthy of our concentration on admiration or not. Um, they, um, we sometimes have to think about ethics, which neither scientists nor artists are too great about when it comes to objects of their creation. But we are sentenced to create these, uh, these objects are, are very important. So that is uh, the, the, the making of things, hands and mind combined, mm -hmm. is at the beginning. So I would like to say something to frame some of these conversations, because when people say art and science, it's hard to know what they, what, what they mean, because art is such a big range. Somebody put a brush to a canvas and they make art, and then you have, say, Velazquez. Um, so when we're trying to compare art and science, sometimes my first question is always, what do we mean? What do we mean by art and science? What, what are we really comparing? But, but of course, um, this question, this question of, um, of creativity and problem solving, sometimes we think of problem solving in science, we, it's very easy for us to think that, but there's a lot of problem solving um, and inquiry in art, which is not typically the way we think of it. Mm -hmm. I think Sometimes that's praised in terms, people tend to uh, attribute discovery uh, as being characteristic of science and creation as that of art. But it's very interesting to ask it the other way. What is it that's being created in science? A lot once you begin to think about it and we worry about some of it. Yeah. And you can ask what is being discovered in, in art? And then that begins another dialogue. I, w I also wonder um, if this question that has consumed uh, science at times, physics in particular, whether mathematics is invented or discovered, whether these equations that describe the truth of reality are invented or discovered. And I, I think art, I would say, let's say poets and songwriters, for example, will often speak of feeling like their writing has been discovered rather than invented, that it is coming from someplace. Yeah, I mean, I, I often feel that um, the process of creation, the work of art, is a process of unveiling and discovering yeah. something that was already there. And in some ways, in some ways, all great art is more or less the same. I mean, this is a ridiculous statement to just throw out, but so, um, and, the, and what we're trying to do is find it, find it in, in the process of making it. So there is an aspect of discovery, um, which is partly why, as an artist, one feels sometimes so separate from what one makes. It's no longer mine, it has an autonomy of discovery, it's something else, and it's that experience that, that generates the interaction but between another. Yeah. And the experience in some way is what we can call spiritual also. That is in the process of the discovery. Oh, you're, you're thinking about solving a particular problem. Why does this reaction go with a certain specificity? But you, you come up with an explanation and all of a sudden you feel in the making of that explanation, the same thing you feel when you step outside on a starlit night and you look up and you see a star and or a constellation and, and you think of other people looking up in the same direction. You, you become joined with all the people who share your explanation. Uh, who, who share that particular bit of understanding that is gained. Yeah. Um, I want to read, I just want to read through um, more of this list of commonalities because it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful list and we don't, we, it, we would, it would be fun to, to explore everything on it, but I, I want to share it with all of you. Um, 
So some of the other commonalities between science and the arts, and you're right, it's, these are vast terms. Craftsmanship, representation, fantasy and imagination, synthesis and analysis, drafts and hypotheses, a common aesthetic, doubt and trust, regularity and complementarity, uh, movement to the unknown, um, and economy of statement. Um, I'd love to talk about that one. The two of you had an interview that you sent me, and you, I think, said to Reld, you said you have described the language of science as a language, the language of science as a language under stress and therefore poetic. Yes, now what did I mean? <laughs> uh, aside from trying to say something poetic. <laughs> No, what I meant was this, that uh, I was thinking of uh, the, that we, we use words in expressing the science and you, words like energy or work uh, and those words have common sense meanings, but then they mean something else to us and it was important to find out exactly what they mean because only when we made precise what heat and work were, were we in the able of the 19th, in the 19th century figure out why those steaming, uh, why those engines in the Midlands didn't work at 100% efficiency. The words have precise meanings. They also are common sense words. We use the common sense words. Some scientists think that the words don't matter. They're crazy. The words matter. Uh, and their, their experience in a freshman writing seminar is probably the thing which will be very more important to them than anything else later. But the words matter and they're being made to express um, to express other things which are scientifically defined. Through that tension of being made to express other things, they become uh, resonant with other meanings. And that's what poetry is about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's what I meant. I think that language also plays a role when people look at, say, a work of art or poem, they of, and, and science, they often want a translation. Say, give it to me explicitly. Yeah. What do you mean? But the process of, of science, the process of poetry, the process of visual art, is a process that depends so many implicit forces, things that are accounted for that we, that we often barely know, intuitions that depend on so many allusions and connections that when we try to use language to describe what's happening in a poem or in a painting, the language immediately gets stressed. And quite often the only way we can make it explicit is by lying and misrepresenting what's happening because... Like doing, um, of doing what? <laughs> well, the only way we can make what is implicit in the work of art yes. explicit is by misrepresenting and lying because you always have to. Uh, there are so many things that, even if I tried, I couldn't account for. And, and, and the precision of a work of art makes the imprecision of words very apparent very quickly. So, so any kind of explicit effort about something that is a work of art or a poem or, or physics, yeah. um, is, is always is always misguided, I think. I mean, and yet we still have to do it. We still have to talk about right. it. Misguided but useful. Um, what you've just given is a rationalization for the value of art critics. Uh, we don't have them in science, except for the referees of our papers. And w we know how bad they are. Uh, this is when a graduate student learns, when they see the first reviews of their scientific paper, that's when they learn that not all scientists are born with logic. Um, <laughs> but the, I'm joking about art critics who are 
but their job in some way is to make explicit this this way I, why I mentioned them and yet they never can they can never get at the implicit value of the work of art and when do we gain it when we engage with the object itself uh, mm. yeah and and one of this difference eh, between a scientific paper and 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 a painting for instance isn't the scientific paper if you do not know about science you think well i don't understand it uh, because i don't know mathematics or i don't know physics but in the work of art it seems to all be accessible mm -hmm. so when you walk up say up there and you see albert pink and writer here at the metropolitan you think well it's all there so so what's, what's missing here? So I, I should, ought to be able to talk about it. And what makes it even stranger and connected to this question of language is that you can copy or you can steal 99% of what makes a painting a painting and still miss something. And it's mm -hmm. that something that points to what is implicit in the work of art mm -hmm. that is not so, um, how could you have 99% of something and not the something? I agree. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's also uh, we're talking about we're talking about uh, mm, words used to art. I, mean, I want to say, in terms of this economy of statement, right? There's also this fascinating, fascinating as an outsider who doesn't speak the language of mathematics, but this way in which, m you know, mathematical equations themselves are, econ right, compressed. They are poetic in their in, in their economy of statement. And um, people who work with mathematics, physicists in particular, will tell you, will say things like, you know, if an equation is not beautiful and elegant, it is likely not true. Um, and I also know that you caution not to be, not to, to not be too simplistic about a statement like that, so. Yes, I think that's, the world is as complicated as it needs be. Um, the simplicity and symmetry are guides. I, um, I think there's sometimes for physics uh, a, a, a going in one direction and, and, and that if you follow it, you will miss a lot of the beauty due to the complexity and intricacy of an, of an object. I think, in general, simplicity and symmetry, um, they set a tone, a piece, a foundation. And every artist knows that asymmetry, from the simplest of diagonals to, to uh, things in a painting, that that's where the tension resides. Uh, in, in the painting. I think of the first painting at the Metropolitan that I, that someone made me write a paper about in a history of art course. It was Carlo Crivelli's uh, Annunciation and it has a, a beautiful, a beautiful stylized Madonna with jewels exquisitely painted and then in everything, the symmetry is there the harmony, but then over to the left on a broken parapet is sitting the world's most realistic fly, a common house fly, painted. Did Crivelli know about flies causing disease which ravaged Venice in his time? I don't know, but it's that asymmetry of painting that fly in that place that made it special. I will go back and look at that fly. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that, um, I forgot, correct, was it Einstein that said something can be as economical as need to be, but no more. And, and the question is, where's that line quite often in the work of art? I think that um, sometimes some things require a certain amount of complexity. And, Certainly, I will very often would like things to be simpler. Um, that would make the life life simpler. But um, but but sometimes there's an inherent complexity 
on the nature of, of things. Um, and, and this points to, you know, when we talk about the universe, for example, when, when s quite often to make a, many arguments have been made why, um, you know, the sci art does not produce knowledge because only science does because of the, the qualities of the universe, only science can speak about it. But I often think that the reason why this is thought is because an oversimplified idea of what the universe is that does not include a lot of the very materials that are important to, si to art and to poetry. So, so it's a circular definition. You exclude those things that are not the subject um, of art and then you say, well, there's no way to produce knowledge with art. And that's the danger sometimes over oversimplification. I mean, the universe is a very complicated thing that includes consciousness and includes all these other things that are very difficult to talk about. Yeah, consciousness is, is of interest to you in, in the context of art. Do you want to say some more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think consciousness is, um, is a big question. Like, what is it? And, and sometimes it feels very much that it's a fundamental uh, property of things. And sometimes it feels like an emergent quality of the way uh, the brain th works. And I think for me, when I encounter a painting or a work of art or a poem, there's a consciousness there. I, I don't know how else to describe my interaction with it other than it's not simply my projection to it, but there is some consciousness engaging me. And quite often, um, dislocating my own position in, um, in a way that, uh, that, to me, that is towards a definition of what consciousness is. Um, and I think consciousness is a problem in science. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe a neuroscientist tried to figure out what it is, but it's a problem in science because we all feel it. We all know it, what it feels to be on the inside. But we have very little to say about it as scientists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I have trouble uh, thinking about what consciousness is. I, I live in it day by day. I structure my theoretical explanations, which are in terms of where electrons move in, in molecules. Um, when, I, when I think of consciousness, I, I can't help but thinking of that it connects me with other human beings somehow. That's not mm -hmm. the way we normally, we think of it something personal. But, uh, I'm thinking when I structure that explanation, which is a conscious explanation, I voice it, I write it down, it becomes real, yeah. uh, it is voiced, uh, and I care that either the student that I have, I had, I no longer have them, or that the scientist who saw, sees my paper somewhere around the world whom I can't grab by the scruff of the neck and tell them that this is what I meant and not that, that, that they understand. And that process of my forming the understanding is sharing in some joint consciousness. You know what that's, where that's taking my mind is Actually, in Judaism, the, the notion of the soul, the nefesh, is actually m more emergent and also relational than, you know, notions of the soul as something that's planted in us or that is purely individual and private. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and what we could extend it, um, possibly argue that that emergent quality, you can bring it about in things. You know, like it's very difficult to sometimes to stand in front of a painting 
and not feel that, that, that the artist started with a bunch of pigments on top of canvas and yeah. something emerged. Mm -hmm. And not just an image, but something like mm -hmm. consciousness emerges out of the painting mm -hmm. that is waiting for you to come to it. And once you're standing in front of it, something occurs between the two of you, which is the experience. And that experience is, again, another emerging, um, emerging quality. And that emerging quality is, of course, art. Art is not in the thing, but is in that emerging quality between you and the painting. You know, also, the difference between not being able to, you know, being able, reading a scientific paper and not being able to understand it, what you're trying to understand is the mind of the, of the person who was able to speak in that language, write it in that language. But when you have that experience of a, a painting, um, you're not reading the mind of the maker. You are having your own experience that is emerging from that, from that work. Absolutely. It's completely separated, right? It's it is, but you know, we have, we tend to prop so many things in front of that experience. You know, like the silliness that when you see Salvador Dali's melting clocks, or you, you begin to think of, I don't know, relativity or something like that, which is ridiculous. But, but quite often, even in contemporary art, people stand in front of an artwork and the first thing they ask you is, what do you show? Or something like that. They need they need some mediation to somehow allow for the experience to occur mm -hmm. because we are terrified sometimes in front of the work of art or in front of poetry. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I don't understand poetry. <laughs> so tell me something about it before I even read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people are afraid to go to poetry readings. They think something terrible will happen to them. <laughs> um, Oh, if they would relax, if they would relax. I mean, all of this, we have absolutely wandered into the realm of mystery, which is also, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, whether we're talking about creativity or, or the way a painting constructs a narrative or the way it lands in the other world of a human being as something that then becomes their experience. How do you feel about the word mystery? Um, well, I, I like mysteries. I like little mysteries. Maybe I like my mysteries little so that they can be revealed uh, in some way. Uh, the, um, my friendship, which Marco Leona evoked with the uh, science department of the Metropolitan Museum, involved in recent years work by two of their scientists, uh, Sylvia Centeno and uh, Federico Cara, on a, the, the uh, double portrait of the Lavoisiers by, by David that you saw. There was a mystery. There was some little red pigment pe peeking out from cracks. Well, it turned out that with the help of a, of a non-invasive procedure that the science department could look one millimeter below the surface and spot the lead of vermilion and the, uh, sorry, the mercury of vermilion and the lead of the white pigment uh, in there and could see that Madame Lavoisier had a fashionable hat on in an early version of the painting. A small mystery uh, leading to another mystery in the painting Madame Lavoisier was transformed from a scientist, a student of art, into a fashionable woman. Um, who did that transformation? Who ordered that transformation seven months before the fall of the Bastille, which is when the painting was, was finished? Was it the Lavoisiers or was it David who did it? And there's a mystery, a mystery resolved. These are small mysteries. There, there are other mysteries we could talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I am interested in mystery, but not in puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, there is a line that I often repeat because I find it very interesting from Maurice Matterlink that says, you know, that all things are secret. Um, and of course, there's a secret uh, 
in just about everything and everything has a charge and and, and but we in our culture i think we tend to confuse mystery and puzzles and mm. and sort of clever games of hide and seek um a lot of didacticism that that then ought to need a, some sort of codex to be translated. That to me is not a mystery. A mystery is one, once you have stripped out everything that you could cognitively and otherwise, once you have figured out everything you can figure out and fought against anything that you do not understand, whatever is left, mm. that thing is an interesting mystery. I mean, Einstein said um, the most beautiful and profound experience for a person is the feeling of the mysterious. And he said it underlies religion and all deeper endeavors in art and science. Um, I also think that's about an, a capacity to wonder, right? Just that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, but, and, and, but the I agree with that completely, but it's so easy to get confused by what that means, I think, because I have seen it in students, I've seen it in artists, and seen it in, um, that we tend to mystify things too quickly. Yeah. You know, anything that could be understood with reason should, reason is the most efficient way to understand them. And once, you know, once we run out of material <laughs> or capacity to, to demystify something, whatever is left is pointing to something fundamental um, and sometimes permanently secret. Mm. And, and I think a great poem often points to that. Uh, and a great work of art often points to that. But if there's anything that you can think your way through it, and resolve it, you should, because it was a minor mystery at best. I have on my desk um, a Greek coin. It's a tetradrachm of Athens, made of silver, part of what made Athens great, uh, the silver mines. And I, on one side is the owl of Athena, on the other side, it uh, there is uh, a figure uh, of, of uh, Athena, and it's on my desk, and I, I'm, I've had it now for years, and I roll, roll it between my hands, mm -hmm. and I know what the object is. I marvel at the fact that it's been shaved off over centuries so that people took off a little bit of silver for their own purposes. But just holding this object and engaging with its history and mystery of the object, of not knowing who handled this object, this somehow I keep coming back to, to, to holding this coin in my hand. Um, I think this is something you said in the conversation the two of you had, Raoul, you said, um, Science is a process of demystification, but not desacralization. Uh, it's, uh, it's, in a simplistic way, a process of demystification. I really do hope when I publish a paper that I explain something to other people. And I'm sorry the paper, neither the paper nor uh, allows me the gatekeepers, nor I take the time too much, so maybe writing the poems is taking the time to stress the sacred side of what I'm, of the knowledge that I'm acquiring. I think I'm doing it in what I've said now in the course of our conversation, acknowledging that there is more to the mystery than just getting the orbitals right in the explanation of this. and. Um, I think it's, that's what I meant by this. Mm -hmm. And I, w I would also, you have also written that, it, this was in your, the Pebbles essay, we are certain that artists and scientists 
will remain standing in for spirit in secular culture. That is a fascinating statement, that artists and scientists stand in for spirit in secular culture. This is my hope for after AI and ChatGPT take over <laughs> in the, that, the time that the, the scientists will return somehow to seeing the mysterious and, and the spiritual and gaining reliable knowledge and in, in, in its wonder. And I think we have, a, we have a chance for being together with artists in this. Uh, it is interesting. Let, let me tell you a little story about this. Uh, E.O. Wilson, who is one of my um, heroes, uh, tells this story where uh, he, um, he's talking about the, the intelligent beings from the exoplanet when we eventually meet them up and they come here. Uh, are they going, to, he said, don't be silly. They're not going to be interested in our science hmm. because they have... They got here. They got here. <laughs> They're ahead of us. Yeah. But they will be interested in our art hmm. because our art, there is no way that Enrique's paintings will be on that planet. And when they come and when Enrique talks to them about it, and they see the connection between the Velasquez portrait and the cover of his grade school notebook, where a reproduction of the Velasquez appears, they will, they will understand the intellectual depth of that connection and what Enrique has made of it in his paintings. Mm. Enrique, I wonder if you, yeah, I want to know what you want to say, but I'm curious. I'm also curious if you have, I, I did want to ask um, through the lens of how each of you see the world, which, and you've just addressed this, how you're experiencing thinking about large language model AI, um, but also your thoughts on when aliens land here. <laughs> <coughs> you know, I, I, I want to sort of in some ways rem remind us that this idea of the separation between science and art is relatively recent. This is part of the modern project. Um, there was a time that there was a holistic um, understanding of knowledge that was where science and art scientists were concentrated on also in aesthetics and many of those parts and artists were thinkers and, and and we have a spirit and that specialization have done wonderful things. I mean, science has advanced so much partly because of that specialization. But that there is, there was a concern that knowledge had a totality, that the question was always, what is truth or what are, why, why are we doing here? And th those questions in some ways still live underneath uh, all these preoccupations. And I think the question of the spirit, um, which itself is a question, what is the spirit? And AI, I, um, perhaps this may sound overly hopeful, but I remember when reading, when somebody asked Picasso, what do you think of painting now that we have photography? And he said, well, photography shows what painting is not. And I think that AI, um, will be revealing of what we are in some ways. It will be, it already has shown us how much of what we have in our, in our modes of rote writing, like grant applications and such, uh, how much of that could be done by a, not a human being, but by a machine, by gathering information. It has shown us that uh, you can propagate misinformation and f confabulate, but then so do human beings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're being very human. I mean, he was They're being very, very that's human. what's interesting. Um, we will learn to live with that. Uh, 
what we need to do is to teach people to take responsibility for what the machine produces for them. And I, and I think it's very interesting to see how easy AI does some kinds of writing, but how terrible they are writing poetry. Well, yes, uh, that's true to a certain extent. How they're pretty good at writing at a certain kind of poetry, which isn't, which doesn't have depth or meaning. Uh, that is true. Um, we we discussed that I wanted you to feel free to read a poem of yours if you felt like it, if you felt called. Do you feel called? I'm I'm going to ask you to read one at the end, but is there anything that is calling to you now? Um, would you like to read one? <laughs> I'm a very bad reader. You <laughs> Well, I will. Um, I would. I will read something since you gave me the opportunity. I also brought my my books with me, so uh, just so just so you know that it's much easier uh, to make a living as a chemist than as a poet. <laughs> uh, you know what to do. Um, the. Um, I will read a poem. Let's see. Um, let me let me read a little longer poem, but it's uh, it's not too terribly long. It it on it appears, I should say, Mauna Kea, and there's something about a volcano and seeing the volcanic landscape, and it's called. The golden boxes of forgetting, um, and maybe something relevant to the days that we are living in. A large room was built for the ceremony. We enter to forget, put an end to forget. Each brings a golden box, you do and I. Some carry two or three. In each box, a scroll, a memory written in Serbian or Yiddish, in Armenian, Turkish, Chinese, Hutu, Croatian, and Ukrainian. For this, we have prepared a week, a year, writing each day until no more could be written writing more the next day. We stacked the boxes in the center of the room where fire comes. We sit and watch them burn, burn all night, all around the world. For six days, people burn the guilt boxes of forgetting. Two, on Mauna Kea, on the big island of Hawaii, the lava flows are labeled by neat brown signs. Pele's 97 act still has a whiff of sulfur dioxide. 94 is a black. Cinders cut my shoes. But after six years, there are flowers in the fertile earth. Three. 56 years ago, they killed you, my father. How shall I fill my golden box of forgetting when I could not at five nestle into your arms? You know, I heard um, Thelma Golden, of the wonderful Thelma Golden of this studio museum in Harlem say recently, She's heard people ask across the years, how does art change the world? She said, art changes us. You know, that's how art changes the world. I wonder, um, you know, as we've, as we've said and as, you've, as we've now experienced, you each have this conversation symbiosis between these aspects of, of human experience in your person. You hold them together. But I wonder if you think about how they differently are there for you in your presence to the world? 
both art and science, you mean? Um, I mean, I think f for me, I am, I am constantly, even sitting in this room, um, grateful for the, um, for what science offers, what what physics offers to me. Um, it makes everything that I look at alive, and in some ways, there's such loveliness to the world in, in offered by physics in this way, contrary to the kind of cold assumptions that people make about about physics. And and of course, and it's a way to navigate the world, and then art, for me, is there as a way to understand the world and who I am in relationship to it. And, and I have immense gratitude for the interaction of these two forms of navigating the world. I mean, I think the world it can be quite confusing and our presence in it and things moving around. And having these two mechanisms by which to navigate my presence in the world and all our connectivity with all that there is and the sense of um, permanence and temporality of, of different forces. I'm very grateful to have this, these two ways to navigate it. I'm grateful to have Enrique as a friend and to, to have had the privilege of him talk about his work, both in the studio and yesterday at the show of the Hispanic Society. Uh, I am grateful to whoever it was, I know who it was, it was a good teacher at Columbia who pushed me to write about Carlo Crivelli's fly when, the, when I, and push me to look at it and then to write something inane about it. <laughs> but um, I am grateful also for having the privilege of being able to pursue my interests in art in so many different ways uh, from that fly through the science to to the Metropolitan Museum, uh, Department of Science. But ultimately, it's, it, the art and the science give meaning both to my life. That Athenian coin is actually a work of art. It's a little sculpture. Um, but more than that, there is science in it, the science of the silver mines. I cannot stop thinking of the wealth of the Spanish Empire when I saw the Hispanic Society of thinking of Potosi and where that silver came from in, in Bolivia. All these things that I am able to think about both the art and the science. This is a privilege. It was given to us. It was given to us by an America that's different from America is now, but it was given to us and we are both grateful for it, I am. And, and I would like to add that role, our relationship, part of what it has offered me, you know, in my career, I found a lot of polarization. If you talk to people in the arts, science is like the weird thing out there. You talk to many scientists, when I was a graduate student and after, it's like, you know, art is like a waste of time. So one of the things, among the many things that role have offered my life was the idea that this was possible to maintain these two things in a very serious way. And that, just knowing that it is possible is, a, is such a, um, a powerful offering to me um, that, that it is, just knowing when something is possible is a very good thing. Uh, you recently gave a presentation at the Huntington Library, and um, I just want to ask you to just, I'm going to read something that you said that you presented and just ask you to say a little bit more about it. Um, art and science 
are both driven by a transformative vision. They reach for the sublime. The sublime is shaped in the mind of a human being. It is a solitary construction, yet it places one in intimate contact with the universe. Uh, I mean, one of the, sometimes we were in the, la in the lab or when we are in a studio, even though we're in conversations with people from generations um, that are part of it, there's something quite solitary about the creative process very often. You've also yeah. called, you've also said your studio is a cross between a laboratory and, and a, a monastery. monastery. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yet that solitary process I I is informed and connected to, to everything and, and the outcome, at least the outcome of what I hope my process to be um, is, is in some ways um, a revelation. A really, it's a revelatory process, a revelation of what things are in, in the most general sense. And, and, and it's very strange that by the extreme subjectivity of the art studio, you can come through that which we call objective um, and and revelatory of the nature of of truth. I mean, I know truth is somewhat out of fashion, but um, I um, I think that's um, that's incredibly comforting, and that's why I feel connected to everyone that has come before me in many ways. Um, and 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 you know even this conversation here, um, I don't I don't know most people here, but I, I recognize our connectivity, um, and quite often what science and art does is show it to us again and again and again. Um, believe it or not, our hour has ended, and it's been so. Um, Fantastic, and there's so much to keep pondering. And I did wonder, Roald, if you would send us back out into the world um, with a poem. And the one I would love for you to read is Quantum Mechanics. Okay. <laughs> oh. Um, I have it here if you. Yeah, I have it somewhere. Okay. I have well, to find it. Here. Here you go if you'd like. Okay, yeah. let me read it a little bit. Um, This was um, just, uh, it was difficult to, to, to write a poem about quantum mechanics and, and not talk about the history, but try to say something connected to the essences. It has just four verses. Beginnings are always classical. It's chemistry after all to burn a log needs to be near another. It's at its most spooky while growing. What one may see, so does the other. There being no evidence, entanglement falls off with separation. Mature, it isn't phased by singularities, a theory that can accommodate Boundary tensions. And how will it end? Like a love in a world demonstrably false in the vacuum, its place filled by the new. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for